Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Frobeter. I am filling in for Mickey Feldman Simon, who was called out of town on a, on a family emergency. And I have with me Deb Elbaum, and she is going to help you with some points about how to uh, returning to work and what you need to consider. But before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping things for you to help you understand and help you participate in this webinar. So Deb is going to give a presentation of about 25 minutes. And during that time, uh, feel free to ask your questions. Go to the chat window, which you'll see on the presentation, and enter your questions there. And at the end of Deb's presentation, I will ask the questions for you. If uh, you would like to minimize the webinar panel, you see that orange arrow up in the upper left corner, just click on that and your webinar panel will slide over to the side and you won't see it. To reactivate it, click on that orange arrow. So before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Deb. Um, just a moment. Uh, Deb Album is a big picture career and life coach. She is an author and a speaker. She has been coaching and guiding and educating people for the last 15 years. She has a CPCC and ACC coach certifications. She is also trained in Reiki 1 and Reiki 2, in Eden Energy Medicine, and the Neuroscience of Coaching. Her undergraduate degree is from Harvard University in Psychology and her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. So she brings a lot to the table. You have uh, you, uh, this next half hour is going to be very informative for you. She's known for her supportive and caring approach and she works with job seekers, career changers, and women returning to work. Today Deb is going to guide you with what you need to consider when planning to return to work. So uh, Deb? Welcome. Hi everyone, I'm going to turn off my video so we can get started. I'm going to turn off my video and you will see slides. Great. Welcome everyone. I am so thrilled to be with you for the next 25 minutes or so. We are going to talk about what you need to consider as you plan to return to work. What you need to consider. We're going to start by talking about your why. Why do you want to go back to work? This is really important because knowing your why will help you stay motivated during the process. We'll talk about where you are in the spectrum of going back to work. Then we'll drill down and talk about the what, all those pieces that you need to think about. We'll talk about the who, who's on your team, and what you can count on those people for. We'll talk about the how, how you want to feel, how you want to approach the process. And we'll end with next steps. What are those action steps you want to take? After that, I will have some time, about five minutes, to answer your questions. So as Debbie said, please submit your questions at any time during the talk. Now, you might want to get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. There might be some things that you want to jot down to remember. And there'll be a few times when I ask you some questions and ask you to write them down. So if you'd like, grab a piece of paper and a pen or pencil, and let's get started. I love this slide of the mommy duck with the baby ducks, because really what we're talking about is getting your ducks in a row. I'm guessing that you've had other big projects in your life, maybe a home improvement project, or you've taken a big trip. And you know that with any project you approach, with any big transition, there are a lot of pieces to think about. And in order to do it successfully, you need to think about all the different pieces. That's what we're doing today. Let's start with this question of why. Why do you want to return to work? Now, there's lots of reasons people go back to work. Sometimes people do it for the money. Sometimes people like to use their brain and their strengths. Sometimes it's really fun being with your colleagues. What's the why for you? I want you to take a minute and think about your why and write it down on your piece of paper. 
why are you why are you on this call why do you want to go back to work the reason this is really important is because there are going to be times when you likely get stressed or overwhelmed or worried during the process and connecting to your why remembering why you're doing it will help you stay as focused and as motivated and as sane as possible now there was a time in my life after I graduated from medical school and finished internship that I took a few years off to raise my kids and then when I was thinking about going back to work my big why was to use my brain to feel like I had a professional purpose again so know your why I like to say to clients you can't know where you're going until you know where you are we can't know where we're going until we know where we are you see an arrow on your screen at one end it says thinking about it maybe you're just starting the process maybe you just had that thought hey it's time for me to go back to work or how do I even think about it or maybe you're further along maybe you've had some interviews or you're applying for jobs or maybe you just got a job offer and you're about to be back at work where are you on your piece of paper draw an arrow and an X that represents where you are the reason this is important is because the next steps for you will depend on where you are if you're just starting out your next steps might be very different than someone who's further along in the process so let's talk about those next steps I like to use the metaphor of a chessboard when I'm talking with people about going back to work if you know anything about chess you know that you have pieces and you can only move one at a time and you're likely going to move all your pieces or almost all your pieces and you do it in order that works for you same thing with going back to work there are a lot of different pieces you are going to start with a different piece than someone else and it helps to do one thing at a time to focus on one thing at a time I'm going to talk about lots of different pieces in um, in no particular order like I said you need to think about where you need to start when I work with clients one of the first things we talk about are your strengths what are your transferable skills after all you want to go back to work you want to use your skills and you want the companies to value what you bring to them here are two questions to help you get started what are you good at what are you good at now and what were you good at in the past and what examples show this the reason it's good to have examples is because later on when you go for interviews having examples and stories really highlights your strengths here's one way you might answer this question suppose you say well I'm really good at organization I'm really good at managing other people and here's an example that shows it I organized an online auction for my child's school I created the website I wrote the content I managed 10 volunteers and we raised fifteen thousand dollars great example you see how it's as specific as possible now some people say to me gosh I used to be so smart I used to be a lawyer and I had all these skills or I was in finance and now I I forgot it here's where you need to sit up straight dust off your confidence and get really clear about the skills and strengths that you bring to the table now if you're going back to work things might have changed since you've been away we all know that technology changes, processes, programs change. So you need to think about what you need to learn or brush up on. And then how you will learn this. Because after all, you want to be as prepared as possible when you go back to work. You want to be able to say, yes, I learned this, or yes, I know this. Here's an example. Suppose you want to get better at social media marketing. You might take a class. Or you might find a college student or a teenager to teach you the ins and outs of social media. I want you to take a minute and write down on your piece of paper one skill that you're really proud of and one example that highlights that skill.
your resume. Let's move on to talking about this big piece of a resume. Now maybe you've updated your resume all along, or maybe you haven't, and it's sitting in a file cabinet and it needs to be dusted off. That's okay. You'll notice that I don't have an example of resume on this webinar. That was deliberate. The truth is there are so many ways to do a resume. There's no one right way. What I suggest is to, if you need to look at examples, that you look online, Google resume, examples of resumes, and look at different resumes to see the layout, the format, the template that you like. You also might want to ask colleagues or friends of yours if you could look at their resume to get ideas. Now there are a few points I want to make about a resume. First is that paragraph right under your name. That is prime real estate. The truth is that hiring managers and HR only spend about 10 to 20 seconds looking at your resume. So you want to use that space right under your name. Years ago, people used to write their objectives there, what they were looking for. Today, it's much more common for people to write a summary of their skills or professional profile. In that space, highlight what you, what are the key points you want someone to know about you. You could do this in sentence form or in bullet form. For the body of the resume, when you talk about your experience, feel free to bring in professional experience and also personal volunteer experience. You don't have to say if work is paid or unpaid. What does help is to get as specific as possible. How many people did you manage? How, what was your budget? How did you have an impact? The more specific you can be about how you help, how you can help an organization, the better. Now you're going to start with one resume, but when you apply for jobs, you are going to tailor your resume to different positions. You're going to have different versions for different positions. Lastly, let's talk about dates. Sometimes clients say, oh, I don't want people to think I'm that old. I don't want people to know I'm that old. You can remove some of the dates from your resume. Here's an example. If you graduated from the University of Massachusetts in 1991, and you don't want people to know the year of your graduation, just remove it. Simple. You also might want to go back only about 15 years of your work experience. If the work you did 20 years ago, 25 years ago, right out of college, isn't relevant to what you are doing or what you're looking for, you don't need to include it. The next big piece we're going to talk about is LinkedIn. I'm hoping that you all know what LinkedIn is. If you don't, it is an online group, an online forum for making professional connections, sort of like Facebook for the professional world. When you join LinkedIn, you create a professional profile, your own profile. Now your profile needs to have a picture it doesn't have to be taken by a professional photographer, but it should just be you looking somewhat professional. Then when you fill in your LinkedIn profile, you fill it in with all the things you did, all the jobs you've had, the skills you have, what you're known for. It should be consistent with your resume. Hiring managers are going to look at your LinkedIn, and they're going to look at your resume, and they should match up. Now, just like on the resume, how you want to use that space under your name, you get space under your name on your LinkedIn profile. I have an example for mine. You see my name, Deb Elbaum, and here's how I describe myself. I'm a certified career and life coach, a speaker and author, helping you find your next job, helping women return to work. You have a lot of characters. I could have just written career coach, but look how better it is. Look how much better it is when I expanded that. You can do the same thing. Put keywords in that space. Now you might be saying, okay, great, I have my profile, I have my photo, I feel really good about it, now what? Now you use LinkedIn to connect. You connect with people so that you can make other connections, so that you can learn about organizations. You want to build your connections. You can also use LinkedIn to show that you're a thought leader. If you're an industry and you want to show that you're still relevant, you can write blog posts and put them on your LinkedIn profile. You can also 
ask people for endorsements. You can put skills that you're good at and then ask people to endorse you to say that you're good at them. And now you should know that people use LinkedIn, recruiters use LinkedIn to look for candidates. They look for certain keywords, so make sure you have the keywords in your profile. Let's talk about networking. Networking is such a big piece of looking for a job or building a business. And when I talk about networking, I'm talking about building relationships. It's about making contacts so that it can lead to another contact, a conversation or an idea. Networking is not going to the first person you see and saying, hey, do you have a job? That's not what networking is. It's really about building your network, building connections that you have, conversations with people. I hope you know why networking is important. Research has shown that most people find their next job purely by networking. These are jobs that were not even advertised. Now, sometimes I have clients who say to me, oh, but I'm really shy or I'm an introvert. I can't network. I hear you. It's okay to be shy and you need to talk to people. Now, you can do it in the way that works for you. You don't have to go to large, formal networking meetup groups if that's not your thing. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. The key is you do have to reach out and you do have to talk to people. I'm going to share an example of how I use networking in my life to show you that networking takes time. You need to have patience. Back when I was working as a medical writer before I became a coach, I was doing some freelance writing and I really wanted more steady work. So I joined a professional organization, the American Medical Writers Association. I went to one of their networking luncheons. I sat down at a table next to someone. I complimented her earrings to start a conversation. We had a lovely conversation. I asked her what she did. She told me what she did and I said, oh my God, that's exactly what I want to do because it was. Now she didn't have a job, so we exchanged business cards. And a few months later, when they needed a writer, she contacted me, and I started working there. Now, I share that example to show that there are lots of ways to network, to go to groups, to have conversations with people, to exchange business cards, and it takes time. That it's likely not the first point of contact that's going to get you the job. When I talk to my clients about how to network successfully, I remind people to think about the who, what, where, and when. The who of networking is you can be talking to everybody you know. When you're looking for a job or building a business, talk to people in all your communities, not just your professional colleagues or acquaintances. You're a member of a lot of different communities. Maybe you go to a gym. Maybe you're part of a volunteer organization. Maybe you walk your dog at a dog park. Maybe you belong to a church or a temple. You should be talking to everybody you know. Same with where and when. When you're looking for a job, you can network all the time. In person, at formal events, or even when you're standing next to someone at the supermarket or at your kid's soccer game. I was flying from Boston to Baltimore the, last year and just started talking to the person sitting next to me. And it turns out he was looking for a job and I was able to connect him with someone in the industry. You can network all the time. Now, when we talk about the what, I want you to think about what the goals of your conversation are. What do you want out of a networking conversation? Maybe you want someone to review your resume. Maybe you want to learn about where they work. You get to decide. The other thing you get to decide is how you introduce yourself. We call this the elevator pitch. Elevator pitch, that term comes from an urban legend from Hollywood, where people who are writing a movie screen would get into an elevator with a producer and have about 30 seconds, the duration of the elevator ride, to pitch their story. Now, it's a little different when we do it today. We're not pitching a movie, but you're sharing your introduction. You have about 30 seconds to tell someone about yourself to start a conversation. That's what we mean by elevator pitch. Now you might say, great, I'm happy to do an elevator pitch, but what do I actually say? Well, here's a really simple template you can use. You could say, my name is blank, 
my background is blank and I'm looking for blank. Here's one way that you might say it. My name is Deb. I have a background in finance and working with clients and I'm interested in transitioning to fundraising work. Really simple. Here's another template. I work with blank to blank so that they can blank. Here's how I would fill it in. I work with women returning to work to help them get clear, get confident, and get a plan so that they can get a job that fits their priorities and purpose. The thing about elevator pitches, don't memorize it. You can have a few different versions and you absolutely should practice it so it feels comfortable, but you don't want to come across as having memorized it. All right, we've talked about resume and LinkedIn and your elevator pitch and networking. Let's talk about some of the logistics. If you're further along in your job search, maybe you're interviewing, maybe you're really almost going back to work, there are things that you need to think about. You might need to figure out things like child care, senior care, pet care, if you've been caring for people in your life. You need to figure out transportation. Are you going to drive to work? Or if you live outside of a city, does it make more sense to take a train or the public transportation? And if you're going to take a train, where is that train station? Where do you park? How do you get a train pass? Clothes, what are you going to wear? What are you going to wear to your networking events? What are you going to wear to interviews? And what are you going to wear to your job? And lastly, household responsibilities. I'm guessing that there are things that you might not be able to do once you go back to work. What are they? Now, I include this slide about self-care because we often forget to take care of ourselves. And I have clients who say to me, oh, I can't have any fun if I'm not working. I can't take care of myself. That is not true. You absolutely have to take care of yourself to help keep your energy up, to help you stay calm and happy and motivated. You need to eat right, make sure you get sleep and exercise, and also build some fun into your life. Really important. Now, since we've talked about so many things, you need a way to keep track of it all. You might want to keep track online using an Excel spreadsheet, or you might like an old-fashioned binder or notebook. But you're going to want to keep track of the jobs you apply to, when you applied, when you're following up, and which resume you submitted for that job. You also really need to keep track when you network, who you talk to. What's the follow-up? Did they give you more contacts to reach out to? When are you going to reach out to those contacts? And did you thank the person who you networked with? You also might want to keep track of what we just talked about, the logistics. What are those household logistics that need to get done or other logistics? Figure out how you're going to keep track of all the information you're managing. Let's talk about the who. We all know that it takes a village. Who can you count on? Here's what I recommend. First, write down a list of all the things you might need help with. Maybe it's the child care, the senior care, the pet care. Maybe you need someone to walk your dog. Maybe you need help around the house. Or maybe you need someone to help you stay sane and balanced. Write down all the things that you would like support with. And then think about the people in your life who they are, and what you can count on them for. I want you to take a minute and think about a person or a couple people in your life who are your strong support people. And write them down on your piece of paper. And then write down what you can count on them for. Because we know we all have people, and the things we count on them for can vary. Let's talk about the how. How do you want to return to work? The truth is we have a choice about our attitude and our mindset. We can choose how we feel. Now, maybe you have days where you feel like the picture on the right, the woman who's doing yoga, so calm and zen. You wake up early, you have plenty of time, you have a lovely breakfast, there's no yelling in the house and you leave with plenty of time and maybe you 
hit the green lights and people let you in on traffic. Oh, it feels so good. You're nice and calm, relaxed. And now maybe you have days where you're completely frazzled, where you wake up late and one thing after another goes wrong. You don't get to have breakfast. You're rushing. People are honking at you. You're hitting the red lights. Feels completely different, doesn't it? I want you to take a minute and think about how you want to feel as you return to work. Write it down on your piece of paper. I want to feel what? Now you might say, okay, I really want to feel calm, but how do I shift from frazzled to calm when I'm frazzled? Great question. There are a lot of ways to do it, and I'm guessing you have some answers. Here are the things I came up with. If you need to shift from stressed out to calm, or from frazzled to feeling relaxed, you can listen to music. You can talk to a friend. Remember we just talked about the who. You can connect with nature, go for a walk or get some exercise. You can set your alarm early to make sure you have lots of time and are not rushing. Maybe you need to let go of something, leave those dishes in the sink. And the most important thing is to keep breathing. We don't breathe enough. Everyone take a deep breath now. <sighs> Doesn't that feel good? Oh, we don't breathe enough, so keep breathing. Now maybe some of you said, hey, I want to feel really confident as, as I go back to work. Oh, I love confidence. That's wonderful. Confidence is so important. It underlies everything we do. If you haven't seen Amy Cuddy's TED Talk, I highly recommend you watch it. You can Google Amy Cuddy and TED Talk, and you'll see it. It's about a 20-minute talk on YouTube, and I highly recommend you watch it tonight. Amy Cuddy is a professor at Harvard Business School who's done research that shows that when you stand in a powerful position, like this picture of my child at the beach, it changes the chemicals in your body. It lowers your stress hormone, your cortisol, and raises your testosterone, your confidence hormone. I recommend all my clients' power pose before every interview, every networking event, anything you're nervous about. Now, when I do workshops and classes in person, I make people power pose. I make everybody stand up. Well, I invite you, if you're at home or you're at a place where you can stand up and stretch out your arms, do that. I'm doing that. It feels really good. And take a few deep breaths. Most people say that this makes them feel stronger or more open to possibilities or calmer. Power posing is a great thing. All right, next steps. We've talked about a lot of different things that you can do as you think about returning to work. What are the next steps for you? Now, this is going to depend where you are. Remember that arrow you drew? This is going to depend where you are. Here's the thing about next steps and action. It should be small. When you set a goal, make sure it's a small, achievable goal. Make sure it's something that you can have success with. Also put a time limit on it. What are you going to do this week or in the next two weeks? And lastly, build in some accountability. We know that we are more likely to get something done when someone else is holding us accountable. Here's how I might fill this in. Remember my example about wanting to look for work and fundraising? If, if I were really wanting to do that, here are my, here's, here are my next steps. My goal is to get information about working in fundraising. I break this down and I say, well, the first thing I can do is call my friend who works in the area of fundraising. I could set up a 30-minute coffee date. And I can make a list of questions and ask her what she likes about it. I'm going to set a time limit on it. I will do call my friend this week. And I'm going to bring in some accountability and let my sister know after I did it. That's how goal setting works. Well, we're coming to the end of this webinar. I hope that through this discussion and examples, we have dialed up your confidence so that you're feeling more confident as you approach this career transition adventure. And if you have questions or you're not feeling confident or you feel like you need support, please reach out to me.
Here's my website, develbaum.com, and I email deb at develbaum.com. I work one-on-one -on -one with people to help them keep moving forward with them, wherever they are on their path. I want to thank you for your time, for listening, and at this point I'd like to stop and answer some questions. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Chloe asked, what do you think is the best first step to take? That great question depends where you are in the process. If you know, can we ask Chloe where she is? What stage she is? Sure, Chloe, could you tell us what stage you think you're in on that arrow that Deb asked you to draw? Do you have a, a plan of where you want to work? Have you very, started working? What? Chloe is at the very beginning. <laughs> the very beginning. Great. <laughs> If, so here's the thing, if you know the field you want to go back to, I highly recommend you start by having conversations with people, informal networking. Choose five people who are in that field and ask them what you want to know. Do you know which companies are hiring? Can you look at my resume and give me advice? Um, what networking groups do people in this industry go to? So that's if you're really focused and you know, I want to go back to this field. If you don't want to know exactly what you want to do, that's a different conversation. That's actually the topic of my next webinar, I think in December that I'm doing with, with Mickey. For that, I would start someplace else. I would start by giving yourself permission to list 10 different jobs that you would love to do, just to start by brainstorming. And then once you do that and narrow that down, then reach out to people and have conversations. Thank you, Deb. Uh, Abigail asked, hold on, how long should I expect my search to take and when do I know it's not working? <laughs> um, so things, great question, things always take longer than we want as a general rule. I, I hate to say that a search isn't working because I like to be in the perspective that whatever you do, you are learning. So as you go through this process, you are going to be honing your skills. You're going to be practicing your interviewing, practice how you, practicing your elevator pitch. You're going to be making progress all along. In terms of getting the actual job, that depends on how proactive you are. I think networking is one of the best ways to get a job. I think in addition to networking, you should continue to apply online. And when I say networking again, talk to everybody you know. I'll tell you, I have, I have a client who got an interview for a job because he networked with people at the dog park. He was walking his dog, found someone who worked in a company he liked, and he ended up getting an interview. I have another client who got a job because she told her hairdresser that she was looking for a job, and her hairdresser connected her to someone else, and that's how she got contract work. So that's my, if you take nothing else, talk to people. Network, network, network. Talk to people. Let everybody know that you're looking for a job and keep practicing what you tell people. You know, what you want them to know about what you're really good at and what you're looking for. Did that answer it? If you didn't answer it, please feel free to, to ask it again. Thank you, Deb. Chloe says thank you. You're welcome. And I'm not seeing any more questions. And I'll, we'll just wait a moment in case somebody is typing another question before we end this. Sure. And I'll say one other thing. While people are typing, it can be really hard to stay motivated and positive because if the process takes longer than you want, it can be really depressing and frustrating. And that's when you need to build in that fun and relaxation and having your support team because keeping your energy up is one of the most important things you can do. If you think about having good high energy versus low energy, we've all talked to people who are like, oh, down in the dumps, depressed, my job search isn't working. We don't want to talk to those people. We'd much rather want to talk to people who are really enthusiastic and positive. So it's really important, even if things are taking longer and you're getting frustrated, to power pose before you talk to people, to keep smiling, to keep to stay as upbeat as possible. 
And again, if it's not working, contact me. I'm happy to help more. Well, thank you, Deb. There are no other questions. Thank you for ending the webinar in such a with such a positive message. Um, this, I'm going to uh, end the webinar now. Thank you very much for attending. Mickey, when she returns, will be in touch with you, I'm sure. And uh, the recording of this link will be available on Mickey's website. And so if you'd like to go over anything that Deb has asked uh, or has presented, you'll be able to do that. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Deb, very much for your uh, very informative presentation. And I wish everybody a great afternoon. It's sunshiny here in New England. Yes, thank you.